everybody. Today I'd like to talk with you uh, about William Shakespeare. You will tell me, okay, everybody's talking about Shakespeare nowadays. Everybody's mentioning Shakespeare. Everybody's quoting Shakespeare. The point is, are we sure that the way we mention him most of the times is really representative of his genius, of the reasons why his works were so incredible new and had such a great meaning okay in, in his time and today as well well today i won't talk about shakespeare's biography or i don't know i won't give a, a list of his works you can find them in a book literature books or online wherever i'm trying to give you a glimpse a hint an idea perspective, a different perspective of some aspects of his work, some of the aspects that made his work so different, so new, so, uh, so modern today as well. First of all, we have to remember that Shakespeare was the right man in the right place and also at the right moment. <laughs> he, was, he was born in, uh, in uh, 1564 and he died in 1616, so he lived between the 16th and the 17th century uh, in England, obviously, during the period of the Golden Age. We know that the Golden Age was influenced by the Queen uh, Elizabeth I Tudor and uh, her influence, her uh, icon, We'll see that later was extremely important also for Shakespeare he inspired Shakespeare a lot now uh, during the golden age uh, theaters were reopened after a, a very long and bad pestilence uh, so we can say that the previous period was extremely bad for England England was poor was broken uh, people were starving and uh, obviously when you are starving you have no uh, desire you have no time to mm, think about theater arts literature or whatever uh, so uh, mm, only when you are really <clears throat> satisfied with your life only when you are able to eat regularly <laughs> then you will have probably time and you feel like uh, talking about philosophy, about theatre, about literature and anything else. So uh, during the Golden Age, age we have a, a sort of a rebirth of arts in general and also on a very practical level during the Golden Age theatres were reopened as I said before after the pestilence because obviously during the pestilence it was extremely dangerous to have these uh, places of aggregation. Uh, so, uh, that was the period uh, in which uh, Shakespeare developed his work, developed his art. This William Shakespeare that has been discussed so much throughout history to the point of actu actually questioning his real, his actual existence. Some people uh, thought and wrote also on, on literature books that Shakespeare actually didn't exist, that he was just a sort of a name that uh, uh, some other authors, like for example uh, John Donne or Marlowe, uh, used to um, dare something in their art without exposing themselves too much. So the question is, how? Oh, by the way, Shakespeare existed, it was proven then. <laughs> anyway, why can, can we say that uh, he dared? What, what, what makes his, his art so different from, from art, from theatre, from literature before? So, very quickly we can say, and we all know that, that Shakespeare was especially involved in theatre and in poetry. As for the theatre, we know that he developed his work his works, sorry, uh, throughout four different steps, phases. Okay, the first step was the, about the plays of experimentations, experimentation. Uh, then the second fa phase was the period of historical plays and also uh, great comedies. Then we have the, the third step, the third uh, phase, 
which is about great tragedies. And final, finally, we have the fourth step, which is all about the last plays. But he was also uh, very important as far as poetry was concerned. Most of the times we, we don't remember that. He wrote 154 sonnets, sonnets that at the time were called uh, English sonnets or Elizabethan sonnets, but they were also called Shakespearean sonnets because of the great influence that Shakespeare had on their structure and on the way they were uh, meant to be. We have to remember that uh, uh, the idea of sonnet, of sonetto, was the Petrarchan or Italian sonnet. It was made just in another way. Uh, it was made of an, uh, of an octave divided into two, and then there was a sestet divided into two, while the structure of the uh, English or Elizabethan or eventually also Shakespearean sonnet is completely different. It's formed uh, by three quatrains followed by a final uh, couplet. This final couplet uh, gives the um, uh, we can see the development of the of the theme of the issue that we got in the sonnet gives a sort of a, a an end a, a sort of a, a solution a sort of a conclusion which gives the, uh, the old sonnet a structure of a development with a proper final point a proper final conclusion we have to remember that uh, another uh, new thing for English sonnets was also the, the structure, the, the rhyme uh, of um, iambic pentameters. So, uh, the 154 uh, Shakespearean sonnets were divided into two parts. The, the first part, the very majority, from the first to the 126th, uh, were uh, dedicated to the fair youth. When we talk about the fair youth, we have to remember that we shouldn't focus too much about Shakespeare's homosexuality. What is more important to remember is that the fair youth is the representation of perfection, of balance, of the perfect idea of beauty, of love, of feeling, of life. And it is so special, so magic, just because it lasts for a second. And this is something that life can change. We can do anything to change it in real life. The only thing that can change this, the only thing that can make eventually beauty or love eternal is poetry. Because in, in, in poems, Love and beauty may be eternal, may live forever. Now, uh, the last part of the sonnets, uh, so from the 126th to the 154th, uh, we have uh, th th this last part is dedicated to the so called dark lady. The dark lady. This is something completely different from the idea of woman we had before. Uh, from the idea of the angel woman that we have in Dolce Stil Novo in Italy, for example, and that inspired poetry during the 14th century, 13th, 14th century, 15th too. Okay, we have something completely different. A woman who is dark, who is sort of a witch. So, a woman that is completely unconventional. And this unconventional woman can often create a disorder. A disorder in what? A disorder in the universal balance. And here we get to a very important topic. So Shakespeare was influenced or anyway used, okay, as sort of a symbol uh, in a metaphorical way. Uh, this symbol, uh, we can say that, uh, has uh, his origins in the Middle Age uh, and it says that uh, the human being, the human being is sort of a microcosm and this microcosm has to have its own balance. 
When is it possible to have a complete balance? When the three, these three organs, which is basically symbolic, obviously they are symbolic, they're just a symbol, and the three organs are mind, heart and liver, okay, they give the organism, so they give the microcosm, okay, three humors, okay, these three humors are meant to control reason, the mind, feelings, the heart, and instinct, the liver. This is obviously a metaphor, okay? It's nothing biological, nothing, it's nothing to do with science or medicine or anything. It's, it's obviously a great symbol, a great metaphor. But this metaphor is important because if this microcosm, this human being, is balanced, then we have balance also in the macrocosm around. The macrocosm around is the universe, is society, is the world. So our balance mirrors outside and our disbalance also creates a disbalance outside and that disbalance has to be fixed. Okay, so that things can uh, go on without uh, dramas. So, um, in, especially in tragedies, uh, we have this uh, element that creates a sort of a disbalance. Uh, and so the plot develops from there, from this, this disbalance. Um, we can have many examples when we talk about reason, a disbalance, in, for example, in Hamlet. Uh, feelings, it's Romeo and Juliet, obviously, uh, Antony and Cleopatra, too. Uh, as for the instinct, we have um, the Macbeth, Macbeth, okay, Lady Macbeth was a representation of this disbalance in, in uh, uh, the uh, sphere, in the instinctual fear, uh, sphere. Um, we can also mention Othello, for, for example, okay, it's both concerning feelings and instincts because of love and jealousy. So, uh, also some comedies talk about this, but we'll see that later eventually. So most of the times the elements that created a disbalance, okay, uh, were women, were feminine figures, which Pay attention, uh, doesn't absolutely imply any judgment, any moral judgment at all. This is just a, a sort of a reinterpretation of women, a reinterpretation of the complexity of women, their feelings, their instincts, a sort of, of uh, an overcoming the stereotype of woman that we had before, that we had before in the Middle Ages, so the lady, the demoiselle in dismay, and then obviously also uh, during Dolce Stil Novo, the uh, 13th, 14th century, where the woman was the angel and uh, it, ha it had actually no depth. In this case, uh, in, in Shakespeare's works, women are often that element that breaks something, that element that creates a sort of a disbalance at the beginning. Okay, uh, we talked about the Dark Lady before, for example, but we can mention many other women in his works that were maybe influenced also by an uh, idea of woman that was extremely important at the time. We mentioned before Elizabeth I, Tudor. Elizabeth, Elizabeth was uh, an extremely powerful sovereign, an extremely independent woman. We know her today as the Virgin Queen, and again, we are not interested in focusing on her private or intimate life. This is not what it was about, okay? This definition just meant that she wanted to be independent. Being independent also meant that she didn't want to get married. Okay, she wanted to marry her own kingdom, she wanted to marry her own 
people, okay? And only doing that, she could actually claim for an independence of herself and of England, of course, okay? Uh, Elizabeth, uh, we have to, to remember, she was, she had been actually an illegitimate heir to the throne because she was the daughter of Henry VIII and uh, Anne Boleyn, okay, so differently from her sister Mary, uh, who was the daughter of Henry VIII and uh, uh, Catherine of, of Aragon, so the, the first wife, the legitimate wife, okay, of Henry the, uh, the Eighth, okay, um, Elizabeth was considered illegitimate. Uh, we have to remember that Henry the Eighth had to create his own religion, his own church, the Anglican Church the English Church in order to get independent from the Roman Church and to divorce from Catherine and Mary and Boleyn. Uh, so um, Elizabeth was obviously the first, uh, after, after her father obviously, she was the first Protestant Anglican sovereign. So she, there were so many conflicts inside, okay, also religious conflicts between Catholics and Anglicans and then political conflicts and then problem in accepting her as a strong sovereign and also military decisions to take, to, to make, sorry. So uh, she decided to do something in order to uh, be more powerful in the eyes of her kingdom, of her, of her people. What did she do? She said that she wanted to actually wear the crown of a king, not just of a queen, of a king. So she could be independent. She, she, can, she could also um, refuse to get married. Okay, she could be independent and a strong sovereign wasn't important whether she was a, a woman or a man, she was a sovereign. In order to do so, she had to sacrifice something and she decided to sacrifice her femininity. So also physically, she, uh, she, she chose okay, to eliminate the symbols of her femininity. For example, when we see uh, portraits of Elizabeth, we see that her, her skin is always very pale, is bleached. She wanted to remove the taint of her sex. We know that a pink, a red cheek is a symbol of a woman, is a symbol of love, okay, is the symbol of uh, the lady, of the, uh, the angel that is uh, often um, sung in, uh, in, uh, in poetry in Dolce Stil Novo. She decided to remove the taint of her sex and she appeared always the same as an icon with her hair in a certain way, dressed up in a certain way. This is the icon in this very small literature book I have. <laughs> this is the icon we have. This is the icon we remember. This is the way Elizabeth is always represented with this dress, okay? This dress is with farthingales, with puffed out sleeves, which are also quite uh, symbolic, they give authority somehow, okay? And uh, in these portraits she is much more of an icon than a woman, okay? She tried to substitute the holy icons that uh, were a, sort of a point of reference for her people before with the icon of herself. So the step is quite uh, short here, it's quite close here, because the Virgin Queen is now somehow substituting the Virgin Mary. Now I'm not talking about religion, pay attention, okay? I'm not saying she claimed to be holy or anything, but the celebration and this iconic value she had 
kind of substituted the icons that her father before and her and herself they they uh, kind of eliminated from the lives of people so the uh, the, the, the figure of, of uh, Elizabeth I was extremely powerful, full of contradictions, maybe, but extremely uh, multifaceted, okay? And her, uh, her idea of, of woman, of a sovereign, of this woman that was also an element of this balance, but at the end of the day, she could create balance inside her macrocosm, which was England, but was also the world, so the relationships between England and the rest of Europe. There are obviously many characters, or some characters in Shakespeare, that uh, remember us of her. Think, for example, about Cleopatra, another strong sovereign, very strong, very fascinating, very charming, full of contradictions too. She was a strong sovereign, but at the same time she was also a very sensitive woman, full of feelings, and those feelings created the disbalance in her microcosm and in her macrocosm, in her kingdom, relationships with Rome, etc. Okay, She is a very, very, very complex uh, figure of woman. Literature books call her, they say that she was witch and nightingale at the same time, that she was aridity and fertility at the same time. She was so fertile that she could even create life in putrescence. This is an extremely strong statement which gives the idea of the depth and the power of this incredible fictional character, obviously inspired by an, a historical character. Now, um, we can think about uh, her decisions for her kingdom, for herself, and her final decision to uh, commit suicide and uh, injecting some poison inside her body and the snake doesn't bite her anywhere else it bites her on her breast which is the symbol of her fertility of her femininity so somehow she sacrifices her femininity exactly as Elizabeth did then there are many other women actually that represented uh, represent this balance in the Shakespearean world. For example, Lady Macbeth, maybe most, maybe above all others. Okay, Lady Macbeth, well, if we uh, should pick one of the three organs that symbolized emotions, we can say that she's, the, she's symbolized by the liver, okay, instinct, and her instinct was greed, okay, she wanted power she craved uh, for um, she craved the power for herself and so she induced her um, macbeth her, uh, her husband to uh, kill the king and uh, it provoked guilt the guilt that it represented by the blood she's got on her hands and she can't wash out because this is an eternal guilt but also in this case at the end of the tragedy we've got the restoration of the balance we got the restoration of the balance in the macrocosm that's something i, I said before um, talking about uh, um, these very uh, important topics that are uh, involving especially uh, the the human being and uh, very deep sides of the human being you can say that tragedies are obviously the uh, works that are often um, used to talk about these topics but in Shakespeare's case we can say that some of these topics are also present in comedies normally comedies talk about society about lighter topics uh, they are more connected to the comedy of art maybe okay uh, but in in uh, Shakespeare's works sometimes we have these elements coming up again for example in the taming of the shrew 
The shrew is another unconventional woman, Catherine in this case, who doesn't want to be subjected to um, the stereotypes of her society. At the end of the, of the comedy, at the end of the play, she appears to be tamed. But is she really tamed? Or she is just pretending to be because she is clever, she is smart enough to understand that pretending could make her uh, free, free to be herself despite the stereotypes. We have no answer to this, to this question, obviously Shakespeare doesn't give an answer, but it's an uh, eternal question maybe. As all these topics are eternal topics, the creation of balance, disbalance, how the balance and disbalance inside ourselves, inside our microcosm can mirror okay, outside and can influence the world outside. Uh, we can say that the big difference uh, between Shakespearean's work and, uh, and the works before, during the Middle Age, etc., was the fact that uh, um, characters were three-dimensional, okay? They didn't have just two dimensions, they were three-dimensional. The depth of their characters uh, was probably the most important theme of the works. And it reminds us some, somehow also of the classical works, the classic tragedies, uh, and uh, uh, how the classic tragedies also gave a sort of a, uh, um, aware, a sort of an awareness, okay? Because people who were watching them didn't exactly know that, they, that those tragedies were, were talking about themselves, but unconsciously they could get something and at the end, during the final catharsis, they could actually overcome or understand more about themselves or overcome some of their limits. Okay, this is what Shakespeare does in a more modern way, sorry. So modern that it is absolutely uh, interesting today as well because we haven't moved from there. We are still looking for a way to find balance. We are still trying to understand what creates a disbalance. We are still uh, looking for philosophies or perspectives or answers okay, that explain why some disbalances are so strong in the universe and also in the microcosm of the individual and how the two things are connected. So this is why uh, Shakespeare was so modern. Also talking about the language, we can say that Shakespeare was one of the fathers of the English language. Normally when we talk about the father of the English language, we talk about Chaucer, because he was the first one who used the Middle, the middle English and in, in the Canterbury Tales, in his works, in main work, uh, Canterbury Tales, obviously. And when we talk about Shakespeare, we don't think about that too much because uh, when we read books today, we often read about translation into modern English. So we tend to think that he didn't write in modern English. That is false. He wrote in modern English, early modern English, which is different from the modern English we use today, obviously, but it was much, much easier and similar to the modern English than Middle English, obviously. And he made this decision to talk in early modern English, even in tragedy, the same decision that Dante made in the Divina Commedia. When he decided to use this language, this popular language, volgare, and not Latin, okay, even talking about such high themes in Divina Commedia, okay, normally such themes were, uh, were only treated in tragedies, but he called his work comedy, Divina Commedia. Okay, because of the language he decided to use, Bulgare and not Latin. Shakespeare, in his world, made a similar decision because he decided to use early modern English even in tragedies, 
even talking about such uh, important, such high topics, like for example, the uh, inner, the inner depth of individuals that uh, influences the world and the universe around. This is just a very, very little, a tiny glimpse. There are so many things to say about Shakespeare, so many interpretations, okay? So I hope that my, my video, my, my, my video today was quite interesting for you. But there is so much to say and we will, if you want. We will talk about other uh, perspectives of literature. So please feel free to leave me your comments, your suggestions. If you have something you'd like me to, uh, to develop, uh, uh, subscribe my, my, my channel and we can talk about that. It's not, it's not just about talking uh, about uh, essays for university or for school or anything. We are talking about the history of thought okay we are talking about the development of thoughts the development of awareness the eternal aspects of art of literature the eternal genius in this case of william shakespeare and there is so much to say yeah so thank you very much for listening and uh, i hope you i hope to see you very soon again goodbye